Okay, it's 10 minutes after nine. I think we will start with this workshop. Uh, it will be a challenge. We are just getting used to this equipment here. We got some nice cameras and some microphones. I think you can see and hear me. Uh, I think all the people know me. My name is Joachim Wackerow, uh, or short Achim. Uh, I'm the main organizer of this workshop series uh, starting in 2007 and uh, together with uh, yeah, many other co-organizers and Erofran Gregory is, is the one who uh, was co-organizer all the years. And this year, yeah, Hilde Orten joined also uh, to organize that. And Simon Hodson as well, but he's not here and he's, he won't join remotely. He's very busy with writing proposals for the new Horizon program. So that was a bad timing basically because the deadline is next week. So, uh, <clears throat> What happens now? Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm get, getting a little unclear here. <laughs> okay, now, now it works well. <laughs> yeah, very good. So, uh, first, we, we are doing an introduction round just uh, to make sure that everybody uh, has a short impression of uh, all the participants. Uh, so I will start with myself. So, so I'm, I'm working at uh, GESIS, which is the Leibniz Institute uh, for Social Sciences in Germany. Uh, this institute has uh, two locations, Mannheim and Cologne. And uh, I'm involved in, in the DDI Alliance and DDI uh, specification development now for, I think, uh, 20 years or something. And uh, I'm also involved in the uh, development of the cross domain integration specification. And uh, <clears throat> yes, I think uh, we should just continue with the co organizers. So, uh, and we are doing it this way that everybody comes to this location, talks, because then uh, the, the nice camera here and the camera here shows the face, and everybody remotely. Can, can see at least for one time a clear uh, visual impression of everybody's faces. And please use this microphone that way, not that like I did. So. <laughs> and yeah, Mr. Gregory, please. So like this, Akim, right? And, and here you can see yourself. Ooh, <laughs> I don't like that at all. So my name's Aravan Gregory. I'm, I'm the chair of the CDI working group at this point. And I've been a co-organizer with Akim, as you mentioned, for how many years now? This is the 14th year. This is the 14th year. So this is session 27. Wow. Um, and uh, basically, I, I'm a consultant. I've been working a lot with the DDI Alliance for a long time. Um, I do a lot of work now with CoData, which is the data arm of the International Science Council. Um, basically focus on standards. I don't know what all to say, Akim, that's probably enough for now. Yeah. So Hilda. Thank you, Arafan. Hello, I'm Hilda Orten. I work at NSD, Norwegian Center for Research Data with uh, metadata related tasks and I'm also in the CDI working group together with Arafan and Achim. Uh, it's the first time I'm a co-organizer of uh, a Doug Stuhl event, but I've been here some times before. And uh, I'm also vice chair of the scientific board of the DDI Alliance. Okay, next, uh, Darren. Okay, thanks. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Darren Bell. I'm Director of Tech Services at the UK Data Archive. 
Uh, I've been working with DDR Lifecycle and Codebook for around 10 years now, uh, particularly interested in CDI uh, because we maintain both social sciences data and uh, very large amounts of energy data. So there may be some uh, interesting things we can do with CDI in relation to that. Uh, I sit on the scientific board for DDI and also the technical uh, committee as well. So doing quite a bit of work with Wendy Thomas at the moment. Please. Yeah, my name is Carsten Thiel. I'm CTO of Sister Eric, Consortium of Social Science Data Archives, a European infrastructure connecting 22 national archives, some of them in the room or remotely joined. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we have lots of social science data that we're trying to connect to the European Open Science Cloud, who has lots of other domains. So that's where our interest in cross-domain comes in, obviously. Thank you. Next is Pierre Antoine. Hi, uh, I'm Pierre Antoine Champin. I'm an associate professor in the University of Lyon. My research topic includes knowledge representation and exchange on the web. As uh, such, I've been very interested for a long time in standards such as RDF and all related semantic web standards. I've been a participant in many W3C groups around those standards. Uh, in particular, I was a co-editor with Dave Longley and Greg Kellogg uh, of the JSON-LD 1.1 uh, specifications. That was me until a year ago, um, where I got a sabbatical funded by ERSIM. And I took this opportunity to join the W3C team. So now I'm also working in facilitating uh, the standardization uh, work and thinking about uh, the strategy of uh, W3C for future data and knowledge related uh, standards. I must say I'm totally new to DDI. Um, Greg Kellogg uh, invited, well, uh, put us in contact so I, I could come and talk to you about that. So. Uh, but I'm eager to, um, to learn more about it. Uh, um, so my background is in computer science, but uh, I've had a number of collaborations with social scientists. I'm, I hope I'm not too naive in that field. And I'm very much interested to, um, to learn more and, and help you with what I can do <laughs> with, for, for that. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, Knut, yellow socks. Wow. Nobody can see. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Knut Wenzig. I'm uh, working at the DIW in Berlin, the German Institute for Economic Research. And there I am somehow responsible for the metadata infrastructure for the socio-economic panel. Uh, I'm for some years now a member of the program committee of the European DDI Users Conference, which takes part somehow in Paris in this year, uh, because it's vir virtual. Uh, um, and I am also involved in a, a project uh, which want to develop uh, a, med a, a, a data format uh, consisting of uh, a metadata part and, and the data part, which will be uh, um, uh, a replacement for su such proprietary standards like st uh, we know from Stata or SPSS or, uh, yeah. Thank you, Knut. So, now we turn to the uh, remote participants. I see Eduard. Eduard, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, uh, Edouard Bateau. So I'm I'm working right now on postdoc at uh, Work University in Barcelona, and I I come in on the behalf of uh, Jordi Cabot, for the one who know him. And my my research uh, myself includes uh, mainly all about knowledge derivations in MDE, and I was more specifically uh, interested in uh, genetic programming for the for my experience. And now the research turned more on to um, traceability, taken at large traceability in MD, so how to trace like from requirement or for any part of the system to any other part of the system. And we are currently working in, uh, with uh, the SysML v2 uh, development team, or research team. 
and um, and that's mainly why uh, why I came I came around here. So my main my main focus right now is uh, is on, on on traceability. I said with the with the work and uh, and to consider it as a as a very broad term. So may talk about observability. May talk about uh, um, uh, what I'm looking at. So, yeah, traceability mainly. It's a, it's a, what what uh, where I can I can bring some knowledge and on on this on this idea of. Uh, what not only having a system, but trying to see what we can um, get, uh, let's say, orthogonally from the system, from the side of the system. And uh, I, I, I really look forward looking for the DDI and, and CDI document. Uh, I've been I've been sent. I, I really look forward to see uh, how to uh, to see how this standard is working and what I can bring in. Yeah, thank you, Eduard. Um, so, Doug Fields, you are next. Hello, oh, everyone. Yes, we can uh, see your video. Very nice. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. So, my name is Doug. Uh, I work for the Consortium for Ocean Leadership in DC, but I live and work out of Iowa uh, in the central US. Um, I work primarily in the area of geoinformatics. Uh, and I suppose the, the things that are um, most aligned with the, with the topic uh, of the workshop is I deal with groups who are publishing uh, their information, actually using structured data on the web, utilizing the JSON-LD uh, format. And then uh, we've developed some software that then harvests that and generates a graph uh, from that. And uh, we are working on ways then which that can be shared with the community so that they can leverage it as a group. So kind of a community knowledge graph that's coming from that. I think one of the interesting things that uh, I'm uh, looking forward to in, in the conversations here is that we see a lot of people now are very interested in not just the metadata, but the data itself and how can we extract further information from that. And we're dealing with formats like Parquet or CDF or things like that. And so it's very interesting to see the patterns then that have been utilized in something like DDI for those kind of cross-domain aspects of how could we maybe apply those uh, in other um, uh, uh, ways or even leverage DDI itself directly in that, in that approach. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doc. So uh, I think by the week, the, um, the, the more people might join. So we, we are expecting, I think, uh, three more people uh, remotely. Uh, but uh, it didn't work out for this morning. And I see we, we got a couple of more screens here. Uh, and yeah, we got this uh, uh, video view of the, the whole room. You see that, and uh, there's Sasha Degas, uh, who is from the IT in uh, Darkstuhl. Uh, he, he made this happen. Thank you for that. And there's also the laptop Kaiserslautern, but this is no participant. It's just this laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's so far with the introductions. Uh, uh, Hilde, please uh, give us some, uh, yeah, some more introduction information here, sir. Okay, thank you, Achim. Let's see. Thank you, Achim. So, uh, yes, we just introduced ourselves, so uh, now we know a little bit of who each of us are. Uh, some of this information that I'll give just now will be 
on for the participants that are here in Dagstur. So those of you who are joining remotely, please uh, bear over us with us with that. And some of the information will be for everybody. And I try to be a bit explicit about each thing. So uh, first of all, for us who are here today, we are, have some ID badges, which we are supposed to wear all of the time. Well, the meals here in Dagstuhl, uh, sometimes they put our cards also on the tables. And if that is available, you need to look for your name because that can change a little sometimes. But please wear your bag all the, uh, badge all the time and look out for it in, in um, the uh, eating uh, room. And then, this is also for us who are here today, there's an honor system. You got a sheet where you can record everything you take, like water or wine or other things you would like to have. And then you just note it, and when you leave dogs to you pay. That's it. Uh, there are uh, bikes that you can uh, borrow uh, freely from the office. You just have to kind of uh, disinfect them. The, the saddle and, and the grips after. So that is fun. And also you can use the piano and on request, uh, on request some other instruments would also be available like guitar, I think, if you like, because here is a, a music room also here in, in Dagstuhl. When it comes to wireless access, you are all on online. So uh, maybe I don't need to say so much about that. Uh, people can use Eduroam here, oh, and there is another system that can also be used through Dogstool, where you use kind of your, your door identification to log in. And here is basically a daily schedule. So this is put up uh, like what will happen uh, all this week, basically. Um, there's a breakfast from 7.30 to 8.45. Uh, and then we have a, a plenary with the remote participants and uh, the, uh, the on-site participants together. Then there are supposed to be uh, parallel working sessions from 9.30 to 10.30, one hour. Then there is a break, a coffee, and some biscuits will be served then usually. Then again, from 10.45 to 12.30, parallel working sessions again. Uh, these will be uh, set up like uh, breakouts. And for you who are here, you will go to a physical room for the breakout. And at the same time, uh, we will use Zoom breakout rooms so uh, that you, we all uh, get together here we kind of uh, log in as ourselves, and then we can be assigned to a breakout room, and also the remote participants will then be, assi be assigned to the appropriate room. That is the idea. So we hope that will work out in practice also. We'll see. Uh, at 12.30, uh, we have lunch, and after that, a walk, a daily walk to clear up a little, and for those you, those of you who are remote and don't need to sleep at that time, uh, you can also take a walk at home. So, <laughs> just to clear our, our brains and yeah, that can be helpful. Then again, a parallel working session followed by a plenary. And then uh, one person from uh, each of the groups are supposed to sum up a little about what happened earlier in the day in, in the breakout group. So you have to kind of identify a person that could do that for each of the groups. Then again, short break. Uh, I think uh, for us who are here in Dagstuhl, we will have a cake at that time, which is very nice. And hopefully you at, uh, at your home, so home offices can also provide yourself with something nice at that, at that uh, point in time. Uh, then again, from uh, 15.45 to 70.30, parallel working sessions. 
and then here at Dagstuhl Dinner at 18. It is possible that we will arrange uh, evening sessions, but that is not really, it has to be decided day by day actually. So we'll let you know if that will happen. For us uh, who are here, it is possible to gather in, in the wine cellar, which we have for us, and uh, there will be some cheese for us, and yeah, you can buy wine or, or beer or whatever, water, whatever you would like, coffee or tea, and that's just for informal uh, talk and exchange. So that's it. Then for us here in Dagstol again, the COVID-19 regulations. We are all supposed to wear medical uh, face masks, both in, in the corridors and we are, uh, when we are not eating and drinking. Here in this room, we have agreed we can uh, do without because everyone is vaccinated. Uh, we should keep distance to others by 1.5 meters. And also, um, all guests are advised to perform self-test for COVID every, every second day. For those who are vaccinated, it is uh, just recommended, but for everybody else, uh, it is kind of mandatory uh, to do that. And if we have symptoms or or have a positive test, then we need to go to our rooms and contact the organizers, which is basically us. And uh, then we'll kind of take care of that. Uh, yeah, we'll also organize regarding possible tests. So there is some equipment available here <laughs> for that purpose. And then uh, uh, collaborating tools. As we uh, are working hybrid now, uh, we have to have some tools and we are already now in, in the main uh, Zoom room, as you can all see. We have also a folder in uh, Google Docs that we can use for um, the common work purposes. I'll send you this link, these links afterwards when uh, this introduction is finished. We also have a set of uh, Maro uh, whiteboards that we can use. There's a, little, a link to a guideline here. We have a conference page where uh, Things that you would like to access, like presentations and recordings, eventually we will post those there. And uh, also, uh, yeah, when you work and you have a kind of a draft of, of your, your thing that you would like others to review or to present or something, you can send it to me and I will put it in conference for, for everybody to to see. So that is also another important uh, use of, of that space. So the Google Docs, uh, the folders there, are most used for internal work within the groups. And when you want to share, you contact me and I'll put it on, on conference. And for Maro uh, whiteboards, we made one board for each of the subgroups. So um, you'll get all these links also later. So these are free to use. If your group find it useful, you can use it. If, you, if you're not comfortable with it, then it's really up to you how you would find uh, the use of uh, them useful in, in your group work. And then just as some principles uh, to document your work, because we hope there will be lots of lively discussions around each of the topics, and then it is important to document decisions. Uh, first of all, it's important to document uh, any agreed proposals and the background uh, and reasoning for the decisions made. But sometimes there's not agreement and there are different positions and then 
it's important to provide pros and cons for, for the different positions. So that will be, then be taken to the plenary and can be kind of uh, looked into a little further there. And then if there are any questions um, for you who are here, we can, we can take questions now. Um, and otherwise, if you have questions why the workshop, it's just to contact us and we'll try to deal with it. But I could just ask now as well if you have any questions so far. And you uh, remote? No? Okay. Then I just want to say thank you for all of you joining and looking forward to collaborating with you. And then, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Hilde. Uh, I think next one is then Aerofan. Nice meeting, nice meeting you here. Good. So do you guys know the lion? Has everybody seen the lion up front? Doug, I know you've seen the lion in the past. Ed Edward, you probably have not. But that's a picture of the chateau that we're in at the moment, the Schloss Dagstuhl. And that lion is sort of emblematic of what DDI has done here over the years. And we wish everybody could be here. But um, normally we have this intensive face-to-face -face workshop and the lion is sort of our symbol, right? That's I didn't pick the lion, other people did this, but we like the lion. Um, thing is, this year, we're not all here. So we've chosen another statue. This is a creature called an, an Elvedrich. And we went to, to the Falzewald over the weekend, Achim and, and Hilda and I, and, and Ingrid, uh, Achim's wife. And um, it turns out that they have this hybrid creature there that is part chicken, part like snake, part deer, and it has some kobold in it, if you know what a kobold is, sort of a little an evil dwarf kind of thing. And um, they make statues of those as well. And they're not very pretty. This is a male of the species. The female of this is, is quite evidently female in the other statues. And um, it kind of like this workshop. This is a bit of a hybrid, and we don't know exactly how it's going to come together. And so since we can't all be here, please be tolerant of our um, ability or inability to use the equipment. And remember that there are both remote and in-person participants. Um, if you're remote, please feel free to sort of raise hand or you, whatever Zoom things you can do to get attention if something's not working for you. We can't necessarily see or hear what you're seeing or hearing, um, and vice versa. So you know, if you're not wearing pants, please leave your camera off, and similar kinds of polite um, Zoom behavior. Um, we're going to have to see how this goes. I think we can have a very successful workshop, but it's going to be a little, it's kind of a new thing for everybody. So um, I don't know, you may have been in hybrid events. I, for us, not so much. So um, we'll see how it goes. And with that, I'm going to actually turn to sort of the next topic. Where is this? Give me one second. Okay, I think you can see that now. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different topics for the workshop. And um, since a lot of people aren't here, I'm gonna name names a little bit. Now, we have been, I think, through the exercise of trying to assign people to topics. And some people are clearly interested in certain things. Um, we've suggested the different people for different groups. Now that's not cast in stone. I think people may be interested in topics that we didn't assign them to, quote unquote. So people should feel free to, to, to get involved in other topics um, if that makes sense. Um, some people will be key to certain topics and will be a little insistent that they work on those, but I, I don't think that's gonna be an issue. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the overall purpose of what we're doing here, and then each of the topics in turn, what, what the topic is, 
who's going to be involved in, and primarily what the deliverables we're hoping we'll have. Um, this workshop from the CDI perspective is very much to further explore some of the topics that we've identified and we've been working with the scientific board on. And people here who are on the scientific board probably have seen the, the different parts of that that we proposed. But um, this meeting isn't really about talking about what should CDI be in the future. It's more exploring particular aspects of it that we know will be important. Um, the core specification is coming out. When are we going to release it, Hilda? Like in a matter of weeks, right? We're, we have, we're literally in the final stages of fixing the documentation and making sure all the bugs have been handled and so on. Um, and that's going to come out. It will get voted on by the Alliance, and then we'll have a core specification. But it will not have a lot of the supporting material, like standards mappings, explanatory text. We're also working on a lot of that material that we'll be releasing um, successively after the spec comes out. And that's not necessarily going to be specification. A lot of it will, be, will be primarily be documentation. Um, some of what comes out of this meeting, hopefully, will be part of that work. Um, we're really looking, though, at doing some in-depth exploration on aspects of, of the revisions to the model once it's out. So we'll be working from the latest version of CDI and looking at that model and seeing, depending on the topic, um, what we can do with that. And um, if people use Enterprise Architect, that's, a tool, that's the tool that we usually work in within the CDI group. But we have an XMI that will work in any UML tool, if that's of interest to people. Um, the, the idea here is to produce some kind of concrete deliverables, that is documents. Now, because we're doing this hybrid, I think uh, Hilda talked about Confluence. It's very important that we have the Google Docs and, and the things that we want to share there and in Confluence so that everybody, people who are joining later in the week, can read what's been done so that they can follow the discussion in different groups and so that the CDI group can come back and work with that some more in the future without being um, scratching their heads and saying, what were these people thinking? That's happened sometimes at these workshops, and we really have to be careful to document stuff. Um, but also, some of the outputs here are going to be primarily aimed at implementers, and, and you'll see kind of where, where that fits in as I go over the topics. But it's not only for, for internal use within DDI and the CDI working group, but also to communicate with people outside and to help them imp implement the spec. And it's a kind of a complicated thing to implement, we think, and we want to make that simpler for people. Um, I think that's basically the, the overall goal of this. I want to talk about the specific topics now. Um, the first one is what we're calling the modular approach. Um, as often happens with large-scale modeling projects, we ended up with a package structure that reflected more our working mode than it did the needs of users, honestly. And we've tried to rectify that in the initial release. We're not completely happy with it. And we've identified, Akim has some great um, pictures to show you about the dependencies between packages and classes, and it's not a completely pretty picture. Um, and we, we know that can be simplified. Um, Edward, I don't know if you picked this up in the introduction, but he's one of the modeling people that we brought in to help us sort of sort that out. But we're looking at getting better patterns between packages and making the packages organized functionally more so that we have a cleaner way to take a piece of the model and use it for a particular purpose. Um, and to make it easier to navigate, easier to understand, easier to use, basically. Um, we have interest from some other standards like um, DCAT who are thinking, OK, we want to take your variable description and just use that piece with the DCAT standard. And that's the intention of CDI is to do things like that. How easy is it for them to grab the variable descriptions and use it? Because today, not as easy as it should be, I think. So that's one of the examples we want to be looking at. When other standards want to use part of our model, how do they do that cleanly and easily? Um, what we hope to see come out of this is primarily um, documentation and, and kind of design documentation that we'll be looking at the sort of target functions and patterns of use within the model at a, at a general level. Um, look at design patterns, how, how best to expose packages to other packages and reduce the dependencies. And that's a somewhat tricky, um, you'll, there are different design patterns for doing that. We've looked at some of them. And um, hopefully Flavio Rizzolo, who's our head modeler in CDI, will be joining us. He has some, some thoughts in there, but um, I think it's a, a good topic to explore. Um, it would be nice to see some sort of exemplary scenarios. So 
I, I mentioned the sort of DCAT one, but there can be others where if the model is going to be used for a particular purpose, what would that purpose be? What would the necessary use of the model look like? And that's sort of the last deliverable here. Um, it would be really nice to have some, some draft model if we're going to reorganize it. So take it, identify packages, part of it, all of it, whatever, and sort of work with that so that we have a clear idea moving forward of what, of what the target will look like. We'll see how far we get with this, but this is, is one of the primary sort of modeling goals of the workshop. Um, the data structure components piece, we don't have a couple of the CDI members in the U.S. who will be joining us um, after lunch, um, who, who you may know, Dan Gilman and, and Larry Ho Hoyle. Um, but they've been very involved in the data structure part of the work, and I think they're going to be part of this group, we expect. Um, right now, we have we cover four very basic types of data. You, if you've looked at CDI, you're probably familiar with them. We have some subtypes. We know that there are other kinds of data in the world. And I think, um, like somebody mentioned CDF in the intro, right? That's something that we know we don't really support or don't necessarily support and we want to look at graphs. We're seeing more and more that data is ending up in an RDF form rather than in a flat file. And that's an, another sort of area we know that we'd like to explore. There are a number of others of these. Sometimes we run into examples where it's not clear whether that is a wide or a long data set. And, and there need to be rules and guidance about how you analyze data, how you identify what it is, ideally, in CDI, or if it's a gap, how do you identify that it's a gap and then fill the gap? So take the existing components in the model to describe a new kind of data. And we'd really like to have, a, 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 we, I guess we're calling it really a methodology here, an approach for doing that that is documented that will make it easier for people in user communities to say, okay, here's my data. What is this in CDI? How do I describe it? How do I know when there's a hole? And um, we've been through that exercise a couple of times with, a, with different groups, and we really think there needs to be some documentation here. So this is, um, I think that this will be an interesting group, um, and we'll see, see where we end up with that. Um, there's another modeling topic here. We've come up with, with a, an acronym, UC MISS. I don't know. We had some cl more clever ones, but they were, they were already taken, I think. But the idea here is, in CDI, we chose a subset of the features of UML to use. And that subset turns out to be very good for supporting canonical XMI for transfer to other um, UML modeling, uh, sort of software packages. Um, it's super well supported in Eclipse and some of, the, some of the, the tool sets that people use. Other standards have seen it and said, oh, it would be really nice if that profile was something we could take and use in our own standard. Um, Eric Prudimo, I think, made that comment to Akim the first time he saw it. So we came up with the idea of, of releasing the subset and documenting the subset of UML that we use independent of the model itself. And um, I think it's quite good for certain kinds of of data and metadata modeling, so information modeling, not so good for applications and things like that, because that's not what it's intended for. We'd like to review the draft that we have and then discuss in more detail what else we could do with it. There are lots of options when you start describing subsets of UML, and um, I don't think we necessarily have the expertise within the CDI group to know how best to do that. And so we, we have some other people that we're talking to to identify that. But the idea would be to, to come up with a good draft, a good product that describes that subset that we could put out for people to use. Um, syntax representation. Well, there's been some mention of JSON-LD already today, and that's certainly a syntax that's of interest to us. In general, I think um, there are lots of possible syntaxes. The CDI model is intended to be implemented in whatever syntax you choose. It would be nice if those things could be standard. We've done an XML example in the spec it's, it's not probably the, even the syntax that will be used the most in the fullness of time. Um, we do think that various uh, RDF bindings will be more common, um, and probably JSON-LD the most common of those, I would guess. Um, there's a lot of open questions there. We had um, Eric Prudimo do a draft binding of an earlier version of the model into RDF, and we have that in hand. We have the XML representation. And the question is, what else? What else can we recommend as the alliance to help people implement this stuff. And um, Akim has done some sort of setup work that he'll show the people in this group in terms of how you map features of 
UML against features and other syntaxes and sort of make the whole thing work. Um, but ideally, we'd like to see some sort of candidate syntax representations in certain areas and then a good sort of template or method for, for doing those bindings into other syntaxes. Um, and so I, at the end of the day, the standard has to be implemented in a way that people can use. And part of what a community identifies to use is their technical representation of the metadata. And we can't predict what that will be in every domain. So we have to be open this way and rely on the model. So this is an important piece of, of the work, ultimately. XML is pretty popular in the DDI community, but less and less in the world at large, right? It only, it only goes so far. Um, another related topic is implementation guides. Now that's a, 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 we'll get into what that term means. What we're really talking about here is how do you subset the model, specify the syntax binding, specify alignments to other standards, and publish something that a community can take and use. And we've been talking with a couple of different groups about this, one of which is the Helmholtz um, Metadata Collaboration, it's called, which is a bunch of, I think 200 some odd different research institutes are looking at exchanging data. Um, and so we've been working with an oceanographic example and immediately determining that there's a lot of information you need to add to the model to make it actually work. And um, we have some other examples of this as well. At the end of the day, we want to have a methodology that tells people, how do I take the 160 some odd classes and select the 20 I want to use, map those into a syntax, look at how it aligns with other standards, and create an actual implementable spec that, that a community of users can, can um, implement and deploy in a straightforward way. And we see that as sort of the pattern that will mostly be used. CDI is more of a library than it is a spec to be supported on mass, um, which makes it, I think, a little bit like life cycle that way. Um, the last topic is a little bit of a specialized one. We have a couple of people who are not um, in, on this call right now, um, Jay Greenfield and um, Barbara Magana. Um, and she's been working with a standard called iAdopt, which you may have heard of, which is looking at clusters of related variables to describe observations of interest. And that's an RDA spec, I believe. Um, Jay has been working a lot with her on this. And we'd like to get some other people into that conversation as well. But one of the things CDI does not do is talk about how, if I, if I have a variable that measures something I'm interested in, what else do I need with that set of observations to provide the necessary context to support research? How do I not lose that intelligence as I cross domain boundaries and cross organizational boundaries? And so this topic is really looking about how we use something like iAdopt and that model to solve that problem, because it's not being solved by CDI at this, in the current model. We know that. And we wanted to, to take a look at how standards like, could work together to, to address that. I think it's almost as important as provenance in really not losing information about data coming from somewhere, somewhere else. Um, and that is it. Those are our topics. That's a lot of topics. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, the coffee machine's over there. Um, anyway, I think we're done. Where are we? We're hitting about 10 o'clock now, Hilda. So I don't know what we want to do next. Um, I think we have some people to, who are going to do specific sort of presentations, right? So we sort of picked some general use cases that will apply to different of the topics I just talked about. So I think Karsten is going to start. Karsten is going to start. Would you like to come up here and have your presentations? If, you if can you, get, you can uh, maybe take. I've got a memory stick. We're going to get old school on you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll wait for uh, the presentation of Carsten to be uploaded. And then. Yeah. <laughs> Well, any questions to Arafan so far?
Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about what we do at SESTA with DDI. And if you don't know, SESTA is the consortium of social science data archives, a European research infrastructure consortium that is a legal entity. We have 22 members and one observer um, because Switzerland uh, plays by their own rules. Um, we support many European languages, uh, almost all of them. Um, and all of our archives have been around, or many of our archives have been around for a very long time, sometimes more than 50 years. Others are just starting up. Uh, so both in terms of what we have at the archives, in terms of experience, but also the data is very, very different from archive to archive. Um, very heterogeneous uh, setup. And we are sort of the social sciences gateway to the European Open Science Cloud and uh, trying to put that into a picture. Um, you have the National Data Archive in one corner that's either connected through national data infrastructures or national research infrastructures, like for instance in Germany with the NFDE program. Um, then you have the domain-specific generalization on the European level. These national archives are service providers to SESTA. And then you have the European Open Science Cloud in the top right corner, which both uh, by what's called the EOS partnership combines all these member countries, um, having these national infrastructures also as contributions. But then there's also the S3 program, the strategy, European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures and all the EC policies and so on that connect all of these infrastructures, domain-specific ones like SESTA or DARIA from the humanities, INSTRUCT from biology, um, many of those, and also the more generic ones, EGI, EU DOT, GEANT, and so on. All of those trying to build this thing together and then somewhere in the middle you have the researcher who's trying to figure out where to turn to. Um, in most cases not being aware of anything but hopefully the National Data Archive and we sort of think that's actually the point where we want the researcher to go because those are the experts, those are the people who have the real data. What we're building on top of them is a framework for them to more easily find it because obviously I always say this, the researcher in Spain will not be as inclined to talk to cases directly because they have no clue that cases exists probably, because why would they? They're in Spain. Um, and making it possible for them to find out that there is data at cases or NSD or UKDS and so on is kind of the thing we're trying to do. And how do we do with it? Um, well, there's lots of metadata exchange going on, obviously. As I said, at some service providers, it's been collected at the 70s. Uh, mostly, that is some form of DDI 2.5, with very inconsistent interpretations of a lot of those elements, both in terms of what the expert thought themselves, what's the right way to do it, also by what the technology or software they're using, does Nestar has been in use by many archives for a long time. Most have phased them out now or are in the process of doing it. Uh, Dataverse is a very big um, or very large number of our service providers are in the process of migrating to Dataverse or have already done so. Uh, quite a few are buying Collectica licenses and there's also, and this is usually the bigger ones, they have very custom or self-developed solutions. But we've also seen the case where people were unhappy with Dataverse and have started creating their own fork and now realize that that was maybe not the best idea. Um, so all of this says that we, it's, it's not so simple to have a common baseline. And we, we, a few years ago, started harvesting from the different service providers. We got lots of interesting data um, with lots of not so nice results. Um, so we tried to fix this by going to DDI profiles, machine readable specifications for how we actually want the DDI 2.5 records to look like. Now, technically, it's a DDI 3 technology applied to DDI 2, but it works. Um, we have it for our data catalog. We have it for our question bank. If you have any questions, ask Darren, because he's the one 
um, who did all the magic. Um, also, we have a tool built by Gesis, the Zesta Metadata Validator, that you can use to validate a record against this profile, and it will tell you what you've done wrong. In many cases, it will tell you that you have not encoded the language correctly. That is one of the most common problems because in particular in those countries where it's obvious that all the records are in the national language, why would any entry not be? That's not been added to the files. Which were some of the original problems we had with uh, all the Greek information being interpreted as English because, hmm. Um, so these are some of the problems. You can also look at the DDI profiles. We're in the process of adding it to the documentation. This will happen in the coming days. These latest profiles are available since last week. Um, the idea is that we'll use this also um, as a gateway to decide what we accept from the service providers into our catalog. Because the next step, and this is what we're currently working on, um, that starting next year, our catalog can itself be harvested by all the EOSC players. And that's where the next fund starts, where the cross-domain comes in. The catalog is already being indexed by Google, so the schema.org information is in in embedded in the files in the data catalog, or in the website in the data catalog, the way Google likes it. Which is not the same as, if you know the Fuji tool, fair tests, they don't like it the way we've done it. Um, for the simple reason that it's in, uh, the data catalog is a client-side application, so the HTML is rendered in the browser. That means also the JSON is added in the browser. Google has no problem with that. They render the page and then read it. Other tools only request a page that then says, you need JavaScript, please upgrade your browser, and that's not fair compliant. But it's been the standard for many years now. So there's <laughs> problems in fair compliant and modern technology. Um, but back to the catalog, you can select the validation gates, you can upload your own files, you can upload your own profiles. It should, in theory, work with all profiles. It's still version 0 0.4 because we've only tested it with very limited test cases, but we're pretty confident that it works. So try it out if you want. What other problems do we have? Well, there's the small issue of what's the actual license on the metadata. For the data, people have been thinking about licenses for some time, but usually not for the metadata. And figuring out who wrote the summary, which is now in the abstract, of those entries, I said 70s, almost impossible or virtually impossible to figure out. Um, and cleaning up any of this will require a lot of manual work. Then we have other problems of identification of studies across service providers. We have the big longitudinal studies that are kept at several archives who all gave them their own DOI because it's an own record or only have the national part. So either they have the duplicates of everything or it's just the national parts distributed across service providers. None of these show up as a single result in our catalog. Then there's the other question of where do researchers actually look for the data? Do they even care about our catalog as a web interface or on, are they only using Google? Um, our visitor numbers kind of suggest they may not be relying that heavily on the SESTA data catalog because our training material has more visitors. Which is in a way good because that means apparently our training material is good and people like it and it's being cited and everything but then again how do we get the data to the researcher if they're not looking in our place? So this is something we're currently looking at. Um, other questions, at the moment, we only have study level descriptions in the data catalog. We're still working on getting a way of presenting all the questions, but then there's question of what about the variables and how do you encode all this? Uh, and that brings me to the next topic about life cycle, uh, code book versus life cycle and so on. Um, yeah, how to match everything. Some of the newest requirements we're trying to figure out is, uh, so for EOS compatibility, I said we want to be harvested by EOSC, which in practice means open air. 
Open Air will only show the entries that are either cited by publications or that have funding information associated to them, which we don't currently have in our metadata. They might be able to infer something, citations in particular, but we're missing a lot of that. Now that is possible, it's just not been done, so that's a lot of the manual work that we need uh, addressing. But there's also questions of uh, authors, or kids, and so on. I mentioned FAIR requirements, making sure that the service is actually recognized by this tooling. Um, then we want court trust seal certification status on the record level, because we have archives who have stuff that is from them, or that they hold, which then is covered by their court trust seal certification, but as I said, they might have virtual records pointing to someone else that's no longer court trust seal certified, or they might be an aggregator themselves. We also need to well, want to display curation level data because we've seen that if you find the link or if you find a data set that is in fact a random Excel sheet some student created and just uploaded to a safe upload depository, it looks the exact same in our catalog as a record that's actually done uh, by data steward. And if the researcher first finds that Excel sheet, they might never come back to SESTA. Uh, or that service provider themselves, right? I mean, if you go deep enough and read the actual terms of service of the particular web page that you end up on, you will find out, oh, this is a self-deposit system. But nobody's going to do that, and they won't, if they follow the link, they're assuming, okay, this is the archive's uh, repository and not just their self-upload system. Um, CVs for licenses of the data CVs for access conditions, because obviously that's the next problem. Access conditions are also very, very different across service providers. What you can and can't do where, under which circumstances. Um, but having a way of displaying this one, you'll get very easily, either because you can download it or you just have to create an account with your email address and all is automated. I mean, this will on, I mean, might take it two minutes longer, but still it's not the same as you have to send in an application and then show up for a physical training session and so on, which probably again for that person having to come from Spain to Cologne just to get the training, probably not gonna work out. Um, all of those by references so that in the catalog we didn't display it in the language of the researcher. So even if GESIS does not use Spanish to uh, annotate their data, we have a multilingual thesaurus, multilingual vocabularies, we'd like to be able to show it to them in their language. And semantic operability, um, there's also lots of uh, questions hidden there. And yeah, the big problem is Codebook 2.5 can't cover most of these. So what to do? Um, Service, all of our service providers almost, well, those who have already started a long time ago have Codebook. The others are happy to implement Codebook. It's not that complicated, but Lifecycle is hardly used by anyone. Gezis does everyone, everything in Lifecycle, but that's about it. And I said 23 earlier, so not so many. Um, Codebook is also much more suited to what we currently have. So, so far there has no really been a need for anything else. And well, while we could do these vocabularies by reference in lifecycle, that's a pretty weak argument of telling 22 service providers, you have to go and upgrade all your technology and all your training and all your processes and everything because lifecycle can do it and codebook can't. So that's uh, not so easy because the other side of it, we want this to be able to push it to EOSC who don't care about DDI, open air formats or DCAT and so on, um, the more likely candidates in that area. So if I tell everyone you have to upgrade to lifecycle so I can convert it to open air, they're also gonna be surprised or unhappy. Huh? Um, Whatever we do, all of these service providers have to implement this. This will take a long time. It's going to be expensive, so um, we need to be sure we're making the right decision as well. And yeah, so what, what we're hoping for is uh, new and improved standards. We're 
very keen on getting Codebook 2.6 because it addresses, I think, almost all of the issues I pointed out earlier. I think there's one, but I can't quite remember what it was that doesn't. But uh, I've been told this would be our solution, at least for the time being. Who knows what next year brings? But um, the other thing is concrete examples, uh, not just abstract models. That's something I've been told by our technical committee, have it as explicit as possible. Uh, you mentioned the implementation guidelines. I think that goes exactly in that direction. Um, deviating a bit from DDI, it's also what I've seen over and over again um, when implementing solutions. If there is good documentation, the developer is much more likely to read the documentation and at some point figure it out. But if you start with, you have to set up five Doodle call, uh, five Google, five Zoom calls to first understand what each other's requirements are before you know whether the service that you're looking at is actually what you want to use. By that time, you've lost half the staff. And uh, that's the thing, write good documentation. I know nobody likes it, but it's the one thing that makes it all work. Um, I think that's, that's it. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Arofan. I have to give you the microphone, right? So thank you for that, Karsten. That was really interesting. Um, a few comments, just in terms of things I'd like to, to talk about during the week. Fuji, oh my god, um, not happy with that thing. Um, I work a lot with FAIR through CoData these days. And I feel like Fuji was one interpretation of what FAIR means for a particular community, and if you don't do things the way they do, you fail. I believe you, Hilda, have had that experience at NST, right, trying to use the Fuji um, framework to evaluate fairness, and that that was not completely successful, right? You, know, just, you just have to nod. You don't have to talk. Yes. Um, she's saying yes, people. Um, that, I, I, a lot of people had that experience. I. There are some projects going on now that are looking at um, what would be a better evaluation framework. Simon, who was supposed to be with us this week, is working on a project with 11 different use cases. And a lot of the outcome of that project, assuming it gets funded, is going to be um, recommendations for better evaluation around fair, fairness. And I, I think it's badly needed. Fuji's a good start. And the Wilkinson, you know, there's, there's different approaches. but. Um, that thing isn't completely cooked yet. So I, I was glad to see you mention that. Um, the, some of the other stuff you talked about I think is very interesting. Um, looking at the way the interface of sort of, um, you know, Google dataset search and some of these other things, traditional metadata catalogs, um, DCAT. I, we've done a lot of work over the years trying to harmonize even SESDA metadata that we harvested off of Nestar servers. God, it's a nightmare. And I feel like you're, you're sort of hitting the sweet spot and saying, if you give actual interoperable guidance at an implementation level to people, you will get interoperability. If you don't, you won't. And I think that's been our experience for years. So I thought that was, that was right on. Um, how that plays out with different versions of, of DDI, I'm not sure yet. And I think we, we need to talk about some scenarios. Very happy to see the profile stuff, by the way. That was my idea years ago. And, and now it's actually working. And you implemented it, Darren, right on. So, so you can tell me what's wrong with it, basically. No, I, th I think, I mean, I'm not the person that then needs to go back to, it's more the TC, but that's, that's good to know that ABS had implemented that stuff um, and had some issues as well. So, so it may be that... Sorry, we're, I'm supposed to walk over here, so you can repeat everything you just said, Darren. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I spent a lot of painful hours with the DDI profiles trying to render the CESDA data catalog and the uh, European Question Bank. The, the semantics in the profiles do need expanding to cope with certain things. Uh, substitution groups is a good example. Uh, we, in the end, we ended up having to invent our own constraints and mark them up as C data. So we have something called a mutually exclusive group constraint, uh, but that the semantics aren't within the profile. Uh, that they're, they're kind of offline. Uh, so overall, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a really, really neat system, but it, it needs f it needs further development on the semantics now. Okay. Uh, one thing, while, I, while I'm hogging the microphone, uh, just in terms of the access question as well, 
uh, I think this is still an unsolved problem until we start looking at things like ODRL. Uh, there's a lot of attempted alignment around access statements and control vocabularies about access, but that's only groping towards a solution, I think, until we, until we have a serious investment in, in something like ODRL. Uh, that's not going to be solved. To that point, Darren, and I think, I think you're right on, um, one thing we've looked at a lot in CDI is, is very granular description of data. And this sort of came up in your presentation, Karsten, is that most catalogs are not operating at a variable level even, and you don't have the granularity to support the kind of access you probably need. I know that's something that, that we've talked about a bit, Darren. I'd really like to explore that more as we look at some of these cases, um, because I think that's something CDI, it has to assume very granular description of data. That doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. But we need to think about what that would look like and how that might impact some of these systems. But I think, Carsten, yes, I mean, uh, you're correct. Uh, GACES are the main users of 3.2. <clears throat> I think the problem at the moment, and I can only speak for CESDA, is that people are still intimidated by life cycle. I mean, what that says about CDI, we need to think about as well in terms of the barrier to entry. Uh, but I think concrete implementation examples are really, like you say, critically important because people are still a bit scared of life cycle or, or a lot of service providers. That's why we really know the topics. Mm -hmm. You can say that from my own Yeah, and, th and that's why we're doing those topics, yeah. Yeah, maybe to, to add, just add a few comments. So, yeah, Wilkinson was the first test and then came Fuji. And my impression is that now everyone's talking about Fuji and Wilkinson has faded a bit. Um, all of those have, I mean, it's just one interpretation. And that's the thing that apparently whoever does the interpretation is doing it correctly and everyone else is doing it wrong. Um, that's what I've always seen. I've been to RDA conferences where people were saying, were showing their nice uh, presentation about surveys they've done, asking people, do you, know, um, do you know about FAIR? Yes. And then asking one specific question and saying, no, obviously they got it wrong. I said, well, no. In social science, everyone would agree that they got it right. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, there's very, very different understandings there. And, uh, Nevertheless, we need to be as compatible with these tools as possible. And yeah, that's the unfortunate. I mean, we're working on getting the JSON out without rendering it in the browser now. But yeah, it's, it's not because we think it's necessarily the best option. Um, and in terms of interpretations, I mean, these profiles, the idea is that we have a baseline that everyone can now test again. So I mean, there's this website that everyone can go to and test their records independently. We've also implemented a solution that checks your entire database in the background. Um, well, it's being recorded, but uh, so at the moment we have a 60% of the records are compliant with the profile, which sounds very good. Now, it gets a bit more scary when I tell you that um, that's because we have a huge amount of records coming from GESES and UKDS and those are the two archives who are very compliant whereas if we break it down on the archive level all the other endpoints have zero percent compliance. Again mostly it's the language tag simple to fix. There are other things I mean out of the I think I mean Achim isn't here so I can say it uh, out of the I think 8,000 records we get from GESES only 60 are not compliant and that's because they're missing an abstract or something. So that looks, I mean, I haven't looked at the records, but I'm assuming those are old records that just need manual fixing. Um, and 50 or 60 out of a few thousand sounds doable. Uh, and maybe also not the most important thing to get right from the first day one. Um, but it's a baseline and we hope that it will enable us to get a bit more quality in it and a bit more compliant. Because there was always a discussion of, well, did the data catalog interpret the XML file wrong? We've always done it like this. The standards allows for it. It should be like this. So that's long discussions and having this, which also took a long time and several rounds of iterations and feedback from all the service providers on these profiles saying you've done it wrong. You can't do it like this. Um, well, it's a negotiation. It's a negotiation, sure. But, uh, 
Yeah, so yeah. N not everyone wants to do it, is what Darren said, and yeah, but then again, Sester has statutes that say the service providers have to do it, and by having these profiles which went through an uh, adoption procedure by all the service providers, they were asked to comment and object, we're planning to enforce it. Yeah. I just want to say it's the intention of CDI, because that's really what we're looking at in this workshop. Not, I think there's going to be a lot of codebook and CDI, CDI codebook-based CDI implementation. That's what we're expecting. Um, we really want to try to learn from this kind of experience, Karsten. Um, we, I think I mentioned we mined, we being my old company, Metadata Technology, about, I don't know, 10,000 data sets, like metadata, off of different Nestar servers. And we found it wasn't even the fields that were being used and the particular codes. It was inconsistencies in the style of the use of the fields um, that caused a lot of trouble. There's a lot, like you mentioned cleanup, there's a lot of that. And we were trying to do it programmatically, which was semi-successful. But it, there's always going to be problems. I think Lifecycle is an example of how not to do it out of the starting gate. And that's why we're talking now about implementation guides and syntax binding and trying really to do something like the profile, but maybe even a little further on with CDI. I think we have to do that. And that's, that's kind of the, the idea going to this workshop. Yeah, on, on the lifecycle question, so one of the comments I got when I asked our technical committee, well, should we just drop codebook and go for lifecycle? Everyone said, well, li codebook has very good benefits, like it's very simple in terms of long-term preservation. I'm pretty sure in 100 years, assuming people are able to read those files, they will understand what it is, even if they've never seen the namespace definitions and everyone. But looking at the number of namespaces you need for a basic lifecycle file, that's hopeless. It's what I've been told. So that's also one of the things. Everyone said, yeah, interoperability is one thing, but..." And for our catalog, uh, long-term preservation may not be the main question, but it is still relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. People, Doug, Edward, we're, we're going to break for coffee now. I guess we're coming back. What time, Hilda? 